dinosaurs and their bones are something that have intrigued us since mankind first discovered them. Something about these animals we never got to see alive just excites our imagination and gets endless discussion going. But what about the animals that went extinct during the reign of man? I think it's about time we give them a bit more love and recognition. And let's start with a little video devoted to a bird that has been the butt of many a joke, the dodo. Hello animal lovers, welcome to the Zoology Girl channel. I am your host, Strabebe, and today I'm going to start a new segment on this channel called The Extinction Files. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. We are not doing that joke. It's too obvious. Do it for the irony. No way. Oh, that's right. I still need to introduce you. This is my good friend, the History Mouse. She'll be helping me out with this video in giving me the historical background of how people at the time saw dodos and how they became extinct. Hi, you can call me the History Mouse. I'm here to explain the historical context for some of our extinct critters, as well as explain many of the changes in ecology our planet has experienced and the historical reasons for them. You'll find a lot of the major changes start happening around the Industrial Revolution, which is my particular area of expertise. And now that introductions are out of the way, let's get right into it, shall we? So today we actually have a pretty short list for our dear dodo. The class of the dodo is aves, which is what all birds belong to. Or you can say reptilia if you want to be that guy. But we're going to go with aves on this channel, okay? Its subclass is Neonathae, despite having been a flightless bird, as most flightless birds outside of penguins fall into Paleonathae. Its infraclass is Neoaves, which means it's also not a fowl, despite its resemblance to a turkey. So if it's not a fowl, then what is it? Well, as its order is Columbiforms, that means it's most closely related to... Pigeons, as well as a few other small groups. Wait, how did we get from a cute little pigeon to this guy. Millions of years of evolution while being stuck on an island with no outside contact, my friend. Seriously, it does things to you. But that's another video for another day. Its family is Columbidae, which is where pigeons and the dodo split off from almost everything else in columbiforms, such as the Sangroses and Messites. Its genus is Raphis, which is completely extinct, and its species name is Cuculatus. The dodo was a large, ground-dwelling and nesting bird that lived on a small island off the coast of Madagascar. And despite popular opinion, they weren't that clumsy at all. From examining skeletal remains, scientists have found that their knee joints and leg bones were incredibly strong and sturdy, perfect for scrambling over rocks and fallen trees in their island home. And they let them move fairly quickly, too. Probably just as good as any wild turkey could which wild turkeys are actually much more graceful compared to their domestic counterparts. The remains also revealed the birds had a more upright posture, closer to that of a raptor than the lumbering hunchback we think of. And despite its flightlessness, its wings weren't quite as useless as popular media would make them out to be. The current scientific theory is that the wings were actually used like a tightrope walker's pole, allowing it to keep balance when they hopped over boulders and climbing along rocky shores. They also probably weren't very stupid either, as the brain-to-body ratio is similar to that of a pigeon's, which, as the history mouse here can confirm, aren't that dumb. Victorians were obsessed with pedigrees. Ferns, flowers, dogs, cats, nobility, you name it. Training birds, particularly, was actually something of a rite of passage for many young ladies as part of their education in the 1700s and earlier. Think of that egg babysitting project you were assigned in high school, only more so. Pigeons and doves were popular because they tied into both of these traditions. I am sure you're familiar with homing pigeons and their uses to send messages, using their ability to find their way to a designated home. This was even done during World War I to avoid detection and interception. Unfortunately, due to the views of nature at the time, it was human intervention that was credited for these feats, and not the natural aptitude of the birds themselves. This attitude was one of the reasons that dodos suffered. Today, we consider the words all natural to be a good thing, but this was not always the case. To generations far less insulated from what could be a dangerous and unpredictable force, Nature was scary, 
savage, and meant to be subdued. If it was easy to subdue, it was not meant to exist. You can even see that elements of this attitude persisted up until about the 70s, with how dinosaurs were portrayed as awkward, slow, and lumbering, almost physically portraying them as less advanced as modern animals, when that wasn't the case at all, simply because they had gone extinct. As Charles Darwin is credited with saying, It is not the most intellectual of the species that survives. It is not the strongest that survives. But the species that survives is the one that is able best to adapt and adjust to the changing environment in which it finds itself. As Einstein is credited with saying, Everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Both are actually misattributions, but they do make a point. A point that the general populace doesn't seem to get. Very true. Continuing on with the Dodo's adaptations, that snoz it had was a wonderful adaptation as well. It had highly developed olfactory bulbs that allowed the animal to sniff out its main food source, ripe fruit. The big bird was a frugivore by nature, an herbivore that's diet is mostly based in fruit, and due to the ample amount of it and few large predators, it was able to reach a large size of 3 feet in height and almost 50 pounds on average. Little is known about the dodo's behavior due to the fact that little research was done on it while it was alive. Hell, the field of animal behavior wasn't even invented for another few centuries. There are a few things we do know, though. These birds were primarily ground-nesting birds, much like many other flightless birds. As previously stated, they did use their wings, and fairly often, from what we can tell, from indents of fossilized remains. The portrayal of these birds as greedy comes from their adaptation to the seasonal climate of the island they lived on. To survive the dry periods, they would gorge themselves on food they would find during the wet season to fatten up and be able to wait out the dry season. Also, because they had no predators, aside from possible nest thieves like snakes, they were unafraid of humans and the dogs they brought with them, making them an easy target for escaped mutts and sailors or settlers looking for a quick meal. The dodo first evolved less than 10 million years ago after its ancestors came to the island of Meridus. Its ancestors were actually able to fly, but they developed flightlessness due to a phenomenon known as Island gigantism, where lack of predators and an abundance of resources can lead to animals exponentially increasing in size during evolutionary time in an isolated environment. Dutch sailors who used them for food first discovered them in 1598, and the first information was published on them in 1599. Unfortunately, very little scientific documentation was actually done on them until after their extinction in the late 1600s. Biology as we know it hadn't even come to be yet. So now that I'm done with the ancient history, take it away, history mouse. Dodos were around well into the 1600s, as evidenced by the numerous depictions in literature and scientific illustration. Dodo birds are one of the creatures that best illustrate the effect of human migration on the environment and how attitudes towards conservation have changed. The fact that we refer to someone as a dodo to state that they are foolish is due to the dodo having had no natural predators and thus no fear of the many travelers that would easily catch and eat them. This very attitude comes from misunderstanding of how animals evolve. The same type of misunderstanding led to a lot of the empirical attitudes and colonization of the time. As you can probably tell, this rapidly led to their eventual extinction. Dodos were extinct by 1681. Around the same time, Louis XIV moved into Versailles, William Penn founded Philadelphia, and Edmund Haley observed Haley's Comet. So, it was back in the days of funny wigs and frilly neckties. Being native to only a small island off the coast of Madagascar made them rare to begin with. The way we think of endangered species today is clearly vastly different from how they were thought of prior to the 1900s or so. While we may hear about an animal going extinct nowadays, we automatically conclude that measures ought to be taken to protect these creatures. In the days of the so-called Great White Hunter, and prior, however, many things were hunted precisely because they were rare, and Lord Buttered Crumpet Esquire just had to get a Siberian tiger head mounted in his trophy room before Baron T. Service III could get one. Bravo, my friend. Aw, you're too kind. 
The interesting thing is that during the time of the Dodo, the concept of extinction wasn't seen as a thing that could happen. People still believed in the idea that species were unchanging and perfect creatures created by God, meaning there was no way to wipe them out entirely. Any fossils discovered were thought to be some creature that had simply not yet been discovered. Today, the Dodo is a symbol of the modern extinction crisis at the hands of man. Some people see it as the first famous extinction caused by man, although it really wasn't. And the phrase, gone the way of the dodo, is often a term used to refer to something going extinct or being lost to time. Though its image in human history has long been seen as a humorous, bumbling thing, its story is anything but, and deserves just as much respect as others that have gone the same way it has, including that of the thylacine and many more. Modern extinction crisis? I knew things were going downhill, but exactly how bad are we talking now? Pretty bad. The extinction rate is extremely high right now, over 1,000 times what the background rate is. Some scientists even believe we are currently in the sixth mass extinction event, our cells being the cause. Ooh, that's grim. But unfortunately, not surprising. Anything we can do? At the moment, there isn't a whole lot the average person can do. But we can certainly go over some options in future episodes of the series as we talk about related subjects. That sounds like a plan. Until then, I hope you all enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please subscribe or consider supporting me on Patreon if you'd like to. If you want to see more of the History Mouse's content, click the link to her webtoon profile in the description. She's got a wonderful steampunk comment going on called Acquisitions Bureau that I can't recommend enough. And if you want to join a community based on different scientific studies, consider joining the Discord group called Study Q&T. Link also in the description below. But most importantly, thank you and have a wonderful day.